Professor Andrew Miles, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. In it's a pleasure to be at the university, thank you. And we would like just to, to comment about uh, person-centered medicine. What mm. is person-centered medicine? Sure. I, um, I think the, f the first question is when you, when you mention person-centered medicine, people say, well, well, what other form of medicine can there, can there possibly be? Um, uh, but there is a, a form of medicine we have at the moment, and, and that is not a one focused on, on the person of the patient, uh, but the patient as a statistical unit, uh, a broken machine that needs to be repaired, put through the health system, um, and then everything that's necessary has been done. But in real terms, um, this isn't a, a sort of a person-centered approach. This is a very mechanistic, uh, depersonalized uh, approach. And I think what we've seen, probably since the discovery of penicillin um, uh, is that as medicine has become uh, extremely, uh, tremendously more scientific, that we've seen these exponential rises in, in uh, biomedical and technological progress that have transformed uh, individual and population health. But uh, we, we, we've seen inverse relationship that as medicine has become more scientific, um, it's also become depersonalized and, and in some instances dehumanized. Uh, and so what we need to do is to uh, not have a science-based medicine uh, or a humanities-based medicine, mm -hmm. uh, but rather Rather to bring the two, bring these two disassociated uh, components of, of good medicine um, back in isolation, whereas at the moment they're a bit more as polar opposites, and they need to be brought back together. And it's it's the job, and it's the philosophy of person medicine, and it's the the method of person centered medicine that is to reintroduce uh, into medicine the missing uh, or the disassociated uh, human uh, uh, philosophy uh, of, of medicine. And if medicine um, is uh, uh, science-based only and doesn't have humanity, uh, then I think uh, it is a very even, even radically uh, incomplete form of medicine that, that short changes the patient mm -hmm. rather than um, gives the patient uh, the, the best quality mm -hmm. care. Okay, so what do you think would be the benefits of that kind of medicine nowadays? I'm thinking about the healthcare crisis, the mm -hmm. chronic diseases, exponential yes. growth. Yes. and so on. What do you think are specific benefits that society can see on that right. way of practicing medicine? Well, I think we've got uh, at the moment uh, a, a crisis of um of knowledge, what is clinical knowledge? Is it just science, or are there other things that need to be considered? Um, we've certainly got a, a crisis of, of costs um, uh, and, and of compassion, really, uh, seeing the, the patient as a person and understanding the, mm -hmm. the, the, the patient's subjective uh, experience of illness mm -hmm. and being more aware of what the mm -hmm. illness means to the patient and to his or her family, mm -hmm. uh, and recognizing that the, 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 the disease is part of the that the patient, not the patient part of the disease. And I think um, person-centered medicine uh, approaches uh, are relevant in all aspects of medicine, uh, but I think particularly, uh, there are th they're particular, particularly strong uh, in the context of chronic illness. I mean, at the moment, uh, chronic illness accounts for uh, essentially 70% mm -hmm. of uh, all deaths globally, all global mortality, uh, often due to poor management. Uh, and this is the great um, challenge for health services now. And, and unless we respond to that challenge effectively, uh, we're going to see a worsening of mm -hmm. chronic disease, uh, a worsening of the uh, mortality rates, uh, and, uh, and a, 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 an exponentially rising cost of treating yeah. these diseases, which could theoretically, and in the words of the World Health Organization, uh, bankrupt mm -hmm. uh, uh, health systems w mm -hmm. world, worldwide. Person-centered uh, uh, approaches are, are intuitively the right thing to do. Uh, of, of course, intuitively, you want to be centered on the patient. Yeah. But there's more to person-centered medicine than, uh, than, than this intuitive, this, this intuition. Um, in fact, there's a, a growing empirical research base, mm -hmm. uh, quantitative data, uh, that is showing that person-centered approaches uh, can increase the, the patient's um, uh, adherence to both uh, to simple mm -hmm. and also complex medication uh, uh, regimens, uh, that it can decrease, person-centered approaches can decrease the uh, frequency of exacerbations of chronic disease in the community uh, as a function of uh, increased adherence to medication and decreased exacerbation. Uh, the hospitalization mm -hmm. rates uh, in, in these chronically ill people uh, go down. Um, the approaches have been shown to increase patient satisfaction, but not only in, uh, uh, increase patient satisfaction, but increase doctor and clinician satisfaction mm. with care too. Uh, they've also been shown to um, 
uh, be inversely correlated with so-called physician burnout, the, the mm. emotional exhaustion mm -hmm. uh, often in, that doctors and nurses often encounter uh, when dealing with complex clinical um, con and social conditions. Uh, so it seems that person-centered approaches protect against physician mm -hmm. burnout. It's a sort of function of being satisfied that you've done a good job, uh, really, that seems to be the, 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 the aspect. And there's an increasing um, economic uh, uh, evidence base which shows that as a function of all of these changes mm -hmm. mediated by the person-centered relationship-based uh, approach, uh, you can contain costs uh, or in circ uh, certain circumstances, uh, reduce them. So mm. we shouldn't just do person-centered medicine because it is the, it is the, the, the right and human thing to do. Mm. Uh, of course, we should do it for those reasons, but, uh, but we should do it because we can uh, obtain measurable benefits and cost containments or, or reduction. So there are, there are, there are many arguments. Not, not just an emotional one. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many uh, excellent um, uh, uh, economic and, uh, and, and efficiency arguments uh, as well. Okay. So finally, to conclude, what kind of advice, what piece of advice would, would you give to a young medical student starting today? So, uh, because you know that students need to spend many hours no, in that profession. So what piece of advice would you give to a young doctor? I think my first advice to someone um, uh, attending for here at uh, Francisco de Vettoria, for example, uh, on day one would be uh, you, have been, uh, you have been admitted to the university's medical course, for example, uh, for one reason. Uh, because in addition to a head and in intelligence, you, you, you've been uh, judged as having a, a heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need medical students uh, with, uh, with firm scientific knowledge, but with firm humanism as well. The marriage, as uh, Dr. Caballero would say, uh, of the applied scientist and the medical humanist uh, mm -hmm. uh, together. So my first message to the student would be, uh, you have an idealism, uh, uh, keep it. Mm -hmm. And um, the university can do much and is doing much via its person-centered uh, teaching uh, to maintain that idealism. And uh, why should there be a need to? Well, uh, research in the United States of America, for example, uh, published in, in, the, in, the, in the journal Academic Medicine, a very important uh, journal for educationalists, has shown that the early idealism uh, that leads people to enter medicine uh, begins radically uh, to decline so uh, at year three, which is, uh, which is counterintuitive because that's actually when they're, 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 these, the students are seeing patients for the first time. Mm. Uh, so I think... Um, uh, to keep that idealism, uh, the student uh, uh, it needs to be exposed to person-centered teaching, like bioethics here, uh, from year one right through two, three, four, five, uh, and, and year six. Um, and uh, that this is where the university is, is going to uh, provide a great service to, to the students uh, and to the society that the students, the students will go on uh, uh, to serve. Um, so person-centered teaching will uh, generate person-centered clinicians, and that gives people, that gives patients uh, a much better deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for your comments, and hope to see you here many times. Yes, uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much.